Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. So I want to follow up on what Marcus was doing this morning. Uh, basically, the first half of my talk, I'll just uh, give a little bit more detail on some aspects of resurgence and how it connects to asymptotics. And now I will want to use these asymptotics in the second half in examples in string theory. And uh, this is work that's been going on for a long time with a lot of people. Anyways, so as Marcus was telling us this morning, perturbative series are often asymptotic. And if we want to compute some quantity f in his examples, they were associated to energies in quantum mechanics or solutions of ordinary differential equations, we can try out some perturbative expansions here around z equals infinity. So the first one of the questions that we'd like to answer is, of course, we know that the asymptoticness means that these coefficients that leading order the grow factorially fast is if we can precisely characterize the asymptotic growth, meaning can we say anything about the subleading contributions, the ones that are slower than factorial? That's one aspect of understanding uh, research in asymptotics. The other thing, of course, is that you know, by definition, asymptotic series means they have zeros of radius of convergence, <coughs> so I can't basically compute anything. These associated singularities on the complex plane as it's been discussed. So, but at the end of the day, if I'm computing some physical observable, I would like to have a number and not an infinity out. So how can we make sense out of perturbation theory? And that's the second question that we'd like to answer. How can we do this? Okay, we've already seen in most of the talks today that the, the object that starts this, this business is the Borel transform. Basically what the Borel transform does is remove, by, remove the factorial. So these FG, they have leading factorial growth. It turns out, we'll be more explicit about this in the following, uh, they have subleading exponential growth. So th uh, the Borel transform, by cutting off the factorial, just leaves up a series which has exponential growth and thus can be analytically continued throughout the complex plane. And then the number should come out of Borel resummation, which is basically uh, the inverse Borel transform. It's basically a Laplace transform. And that integration over a ray, which is written there, is, is very nice as long as we don't cross singularities of the Borel transform. And there will always be singularities of the Borel transform because the starting series was, was asymptotic. Basically, asymptotic implies singularities of Borel. So how can we go about this. So the first question we can ask is what class of singularities can we find on Borel transforms? And there's a, a very broad definition of what we can find, which we will not use, and then there's a simple one. The very broad is the definition of resurgent function, which basically means that our resurgent asymptotic series, if you want. Uh, a formal asymptotic series is a resurgence it's if its Borel transform has endless analytic continuation. This is very broad if we want to make some formula explicit. A slightly simpler definition, which in fact has the name simple, <laughs> is uh, uh, to consider the class of functions or of power series, formal power series, whose Borel singularity restrict to simple poles and logarithmic branch points. That's what we shall consider. In fact, in most of the formula I will show, I will not even put simple poles. I'll just put logarithmic branch points. So here's an example. Omega is some simple singularity. S is a complex number, and phi omega is some other sector. What do I mean by f some other sector? It means that at around omega, this expression I'm writing here in blue is what happens to the Borel transform around omega, we have a logarithmic branch point, that's the log which is there, and in front of it I may have some holomorphic function. So I'll understand this holomorphic function as the Borel transform of some other sector, and I'll denote that some other sector by phi omega. If we do this, now we can be very precise about what happens when we cross the Stokes line. The Stokes line, of course, was the line wherever, when I'm rotating that theta in the, in the, in the Borel resummation, when I cross the singularity. Because now I know how to classify singularities for this class of functions. So how can we do that? Here's the picture. I have a, a line <coughs> with direction theta along which I have many singularities. And I'm avoiding them by uh, doing the Borel resummation slightly to the left, that's the theta plus, or slightly to the right, that's the theta minus. What's the difference? Well, the difference is now very easy to compute. If I assume that next to each, that uh, around each singularity, what I have is just this structure. And then all I have to do is plug in and do the calculation. It's not too hard to see that uh, this will imply discontinuity of f, the energy in quantum mechanics or the solution to the ordinary differential equation or whatever from this example from this morning, that I want to compute. 
And this discontinuity, perhaps I can use this. The term here, the Z here, remember we're doing an expansion around Z equals infinity. So that's the, the usual non-analytic, that's non-analytic around Z equals infinity. The non-analytic contribution. I have these complex numbers, which if you want, you can call them as the Borel residues. If I were to put the simple pole, they would appear with the simple pole. And then I have these other sectors. So you see that these sectors must be included in the full solution. The perturbative series is not enough. F was the perturbative series I was starting off with. That doesn't have all the information because as I start going around in the Borel plane, these guys will show up. And that's essentially what leads to trans series and to resurgence. So that's the basic idea. And of course, a little bit in this context, that's what uh, I will want to discuss now. How to, um, what, what kind of objects are important in resurgence and how they can allow us to study the asymptotics, to know what's behind that factorial growth. And then that will be the first half. And then the second half, we'll discuss how to apply these things in string theory and we'll see how far we can go. All right, some basics. Well, the, the, the idea is very basic on how to define a general uh, trans series. Basically, analytic functions are described by power series. If I want to describe general non-analytic functions, I just augment power series with non-analytic terms. So the idea is very, very simple. But it can lead to extremely complicated objects. It's not too hard to see. Now I'm doing things around x equals 0. But if I start iterating the standard non-analytic term, I can get arbitrary weird things, which are extremely suppressed and hard to see. Or I can put logs, or I can combine everything, and so on. Interestingly enough, although all this is allowed, in the examples that we've studied at least so far in string theory, we just find the standard exponential of minus 1 over x and a few logs. So it doesn't mean that these guys are not there. At least we have not <coughs> seen them yet. So what's the idea? We put everybody together. This is what I would call a one parameter trans series. So F0 there would be the, the, the perturbative series I started off with. And then I can have instanton sectors with instanton action A and then some asymptotic series around each sector. I'll denote the asymptotic series just by capital Phi. And this is double perturbative expansion, since that it's perturbative not only in the original coupling, but also in this non-analytic contribution. Sigma here is a trans series parameter, which is an instanton counting parameter, but perhaps more interesting for what we'll discuss later on, it's, it's sort of parametrizing a choice of boundary conditions. So if this is sort of an ansatz for a solution to a nonlinear first order differential equation, the trans series, you can think of it as the general solution. <coughs> And particular solutions where I specify boundary conditions are particularly choices of sigma. Now, this trans series yields very general solutions to nonlinear systems because I just plug things into, say, this nonlinear differential equation, and I can compute all these coefficients. They, I basically get a hierarchy of recursive equations that tell me what all these guys are. And the resurgence is the statement that that different instanton number and that different loop number loop level, whatever you want to call it, things relate to each other. So that's why there's this slogan that you can obtain non-perturbative data out of perturbative data. It's this relation in between all these coefficients. All right. The discontinuity, now it's just the only technical things I want to discuss <coughs> is this concept of the alien derivative and why the discontinuity is not good, or at least not good enough. Remember, when I cross the Stokes line, when I have simple singularities, it's easy to uncover an operator, which is the discontinuity across the Stokes line. But we can do better, because there's a more interesting object than the discontinuity, which has the property of being a derivation, so-called alien derivation in the terminology of Eccal. So how do we improve the discontinuity to get the derivation? Basically, we just rewrite the discontinuity. This was the difference between the left and the right resummations as an automorphism in this way. So basically, it's automorphism relating the left and right resummations. I'll call it the Stokes automorphism and denote it with this funny notation, which is standard in the literature. So how can I get a derivative out of it is? Just by taking the log, right? Automorphisms are exponentials of derivatives, so I can define 
this so-called pointed alien derivative, it again has a funny notation and a funny name, in this way. Notice that it's improving the discontinuity with iterations of the discontinuity over there. And in fact, there is another definition. There's a direct definition of this operator as a specific sort of weighted average that if I want to know, let's say, at some point, wrong way, at some point, what would be the alien derivative there? I sort of weight all possible contours that take me up to there, and uh, we're doing analytic continuation of the Borel transform. But that's too technical, and it doesn't really matter for just a comment for what I want to tell you. Automorphism of what? I'm sorry? Automorphism of what? Uh, I will be more specific when I, when I will write down the trans series. For the moment, just think about something that's taking you from the left to the right resummation. So basically gets uh, a resummation of a, of a formal series to the right and the resummation of, of the formal power series to the left. But it will act on the trans series parameters. I'll show you these in two slides. It will be more clear. So along the Stokes line, we can decompose this, this object at all the possible singularities and define the derivative at each singularity, the standard alien derivative just with the non-analytic term. This will also appear in the next slide. All right, so what we can do with these things. Uh, a key property of this object <coughs> is that it commutes with the standard derivative. So if f, if our trans series, is an asset for the solution of some, some first order nonlinear ODE, then these two objects, because this is the, the derivative with respect to the, the trans series parameter. And this is just the alien derivative which has that property, and which this one also has. They, of course, satisfy the same linear ordinary differential equation, which means they must be proportional to each other. And this is known as a bridge equation, specifying a bridge between alien derivatives and standard derivatives. So now I kind of know how to compute these guys if I know how to take standard derivatives. It doesn't seem too hard. And in fact, that's what happens. So along a Stokes line, where I have singularities at k times a, regularity and homogeneity say that the proportionality factor is actually uh, an object of this form. It has to have a certain power of sigma times some numbers. And when I write down for the components of the trans series, let me show them again, the components of the trans series are the power series which are there. Can you recall where sigma comes from? Because yes. Sigma, I just introduce it there as an object which is counting, if you want, the powers of the non-analytic term. And as I try to kind of motivate, <coughs> it's parameterizing a choice of boundary conditions for this ordinary differential equation that you may have. The alien derivative acting on each of the components is just a number times n plus k. So you see, when I'm acting on the nth sector, at the kth singularity, I get the nth plus k sector. And the only thing I don't know here are these numbers s. They're a call analytic invariance. That's their name. Let me show the, rewrite this formula. And uh, this is sort of the, the punchline of resurgence. That's the formula again. So basically what this is saying is that I've computed now all alien derivatives. Equivalently, I've computed all Borel singularities. This is the structure I have. That object is a derivative in the sense that it could be, it satisfies Leibniz's rule. So it's a derivative with respect on the formal power series when they just are multiplied with the, the standard uh, product. Or if you want, uh, uh, it could be a sort of a derivative acting on the Borel transforms when they're basically convoluted. So it sa satisfies Leibniz's rule either to the standard product or to the convolution product. And the statement is this, let me read it for you. At the case singularity of the Borel or the phi n instant on sector, one finds the resurgence of the Borel or phi n plus k instant on sector. So I've computed everything. The information is encoded in terms of the analytic invariance or the Borel residues. They're not equal, but they relate to each other. There are some formula that can take from one to the others. And here's the picture. So this is basically all you need to have in mind about all this that I've just told you. You can think of the trans series as a sort of a chain. Here's the perturbative, one instant on, so on. 
And these alien derivatives, these objects here, induce specific motions on the chain. There's basically only one way to move forward, but there's many ways to move backwards. And it's this combinatorics of the difference between how can I move forward and in how many different ways can I move backwards that will allow me to write down some uh, general formula for asymptotics. But basically, in a punchline, this is all you need to, to, to retain from the previous a little bit technical slide. There's a bonus as well. And now this, I hope, will answer your question on what the automorphism was. Is that this formalism gives me a full description of Stokes' phenomenon in one expression. The Stokes automorphism, <coughs> remember, was def by definition, was the exponential of the alien derivative. But now the bridge equation tells me that I can rewrite the alien derivative as a regular derivative. And here's what happens when theta is zero. So when I move forward, I only have one possibility. This is the only allowed forward motion in the previous picture. And this, of course, <laughs> creates an automorphism, which is just a translation along the sigma direction. And this is a clear illustration of Stokes' phenomenon, right? If I had sigma equals zero, all I had was my power series, and I could not see exponentially suppressed stuff. But upon Stokes' phenomenon, I must grab them and take them along for the ride, because you know, things which are small in some regions of the complex plane can be big elsewhere, and they may change the physics of, of the problem we're studying. But that's not the only Stokes phenomenon there is. There's also long <coughs> pi. A long pi, in fact, I have a lot of singularities. <coughs> and when I just uh, play this game, the automorphism is more complicated. It's generated by the one permitted flow of this vector field here. But you can write it down. Anyway, so Stokes phenomenon comes for free in this business. The other question that I had was, how can I resum things? If these objects are asymptotic, how can I get numbers out? Here's the summation in a nutshell. So in string theory, what I will want to compute will be the free energy or the partition function. It's known that the free energy has a genus expansion that looks like that. GS is the string coupling. T is some moduli associated to whatever geometry I'm looking at. And this goes essentially uh, associated to different uh, genus of Riemann surfaces that define for you the perturbative expansion of string theory. They have large order behavior. This is known since the early 90s. <coughs> 2G factorial. So the topological genus expansion is asymptotic, and we will need to complete it somehow by including some instanton sectors in the trans series. These, these building blocks of the trans series are new asymptotic series associated to instanton sectors, which have the usual structure. They look like that. If we want to have numbers out, what's the game to play? It goes in a couple of steps. The first step is Borel resummation, where I must make sure that theta is not hitting a Stokes line. In practice, what you actually do is Borel Pade. What do I mean by this? We don't know all these terms. We can generate them iteratively if you want, but we don't have closed form expressions for them. So we don't, if we don't know all of them, we cannot exactly pinpoint what the Borel transform is, but we can approximate it. Of course, we can approximate it as different ways. The most interesting way to approximate it here is with Pode appro approximants, because they're rational functions, and they will give us a sort of a pictorial view of where these singularities supposedly logarithmic singularities, if this is a simple case, will be, I'm sorry, the iPad just goes off if I just am not doing anything on it. Here we are. Um, we want to see the singularities of this function, and the best way to do it is to approximate it by a rational function, by, by the approximants. In practice as well, this integral will be evaluated numerically, so it's not going to go all the way to infinity. But anyways, there's some approximations here that are under control because they're well known numerical approximations. And once we have all these objects, we need to assemble them back into the trans series. Here's the example of the trans series with instanton action A, G string there, the string coupling. All these guys have been numerically evaluated, but I, need, I still need to say two things. First, what is sigma? And what happens 
when theta crosses the Stokes line. Here's the picture. The trend series will allow us to reach arbitrary coupling, even strong coupling if you want, and it will allow us to venture into the complex plane if we properly incorporate Stokes phenomenon. This has been done in the string theory context uh, recently. So when, this is the same picture I showed you before, right? What happens when you cross the Stokes line? So what happens when you cross the Stokes line, we know, is that sigma is going to jump by the Stokes constant. So we can turn on or off an infinite set of multi-instanton corrections. This is very important in some of these examples because these exponentially suppressed contributions can become exponentially enhanced somewhere else. So when you're describing the free energy or the partition function of some string models, it could be that you have regions of the complex plane of the coupling where the dominance is no longer associated to the perturbative series you started off with, but to instantons. And in fact, it happens in some of those examples. So that's the idea of resummation. Now, let me tell you about what's the relation of these ideas to asymptotics, because somehow that's how we're going to test that what we're doing is valid. We come up with suggestions of trans series to describe the free energy or the partition function of some string theory, and we want to make sure, is this suggestion of the trans series good or bad? And we can test it by resorting to asymptotics. The idea is very simple. It's just basically Cauchy theorem. Cauchy theorem tells me that I can rewrite some function f, which has some branch cuts. Here I'm putting a long term direct in theta as its discontinuity around theta plus some contribution at infinity. In most situations, in fact, in all that we have been addressing, the contribution at infinity does, does not, the, vanishes basically, does not contribute to the problem. So we have a connection between, if you want, if I just plug here, the perturbative expansion for the free energy. I know that the discontinuity is going to be given to me by this basically computation of all these alien derivatives. And it's given in terms of the other sectors, the instanton sectors. I have a connection between perturbative and non-perturbative data. Let me show you some formulae and some pictures. Here's the perturbative sector. I can compute exactly the discontinuity along zero because I know all alien derivatives, it's that quantity. And if I just plug into the Cauchy dispersion relation, I get a closed form expression. Let's look at the first few terms, again in the spirit of what we've been doing this afternoon. I have the factorial growth. I have the subleading exponential growth controlled by the instanton action. I have the proportionality factor given by the Stokes constant. And then I get the one instanton contributions, one loop, two loops, and so on, which comes with powers of 1 over g. Then I get further exponentially suppressed stuff. Here, 2 to the minus g. This is the two instantons. And the loops around the two instantons, and so on. So in a picture, what this is saying is that if I know the instanton sectors, I can predict the large order growth of my perturbative series. This is kind of obvious. But what we'd like to do is sort of the reverse way. I can predict the large order behavior if I know what's going on with the multi-instanton sectors, but I can also just, by <coughs> looking at th this, this series, this series of, asymptotic of, uh, of, sorry, of perturbative components, I can decompose it into its powers of 1 over g, exponential factors integer to minus g, and so on, and try to extract information about all those non-perturbative sectors. Of course, there's a structural need for the Stokes constants. I need to know what they are. And in some cases, we can only access them numerically. We don't have an analytic uh, first principle way of computing them. In some others, we do. The advantage here is that this picture doesn't hold only for the perturbative sector. It holds for arbitrary multi-instanton sectors. Here's an example. Of course, now, remember this picture I had of the trans series before where there were allowed motions going back and forth. Here's the forward guys. They're going to be easy. Here's the backward guys. Now, there were, remember, there were lots of ways to go back, so the combinatorics is a little bit more <laughs> intricate. And in fact, if I write the formula for that, I'm not going to show you all the combinatorics. So the forward guys, they have a similar expression to what the perturbative has. 
But the backward guys, I'm not showing all of them. There are three dots there. They're given by a sum over partitions, which is a little bit harder to pinpoint. And all Stokes constants will appear now. We can go to more complicated problems where there's more than one instant on action. Instead of having a, a chain with allowed motions, I now have a lattice with more complicated allowed motions. Basically, this is a lattice for a case of uh, two instant on actions. And the first quadrant, I cannot access it with these motions dictated by the alien derivative, but sort of the second, third, fourth, I can get there. Here I'm just showing some elementary motions, but there's more because I can iterate them. And the combinatorics is going to be even more complicated. Let me show you some formula just for the flavor of it. Here's the case where I have two instant on actions, A and minus A. And immediately at perturbative level, I held, have these continuities around 0 and pi. I'll have nasty formulas. Let's not mind about the big formula. Let's just look at the leading terms. The interesting thing here is that in many examples, this terms here, the F terms, the 1 slash 0 and 0 slash 1 instantons at one loop, they have some symmetry, so they basically relate to each other. And we can decide, if you just put it on the computer, if what I'm looking at is a problem that only has an instanton action or has perhaps two instanton actions organized like this. The difference, of course, is that if this term is not there, I just see in the computer dot, 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 dot coming out of large order tests. But if both of them are there, they're going to be oscillating. So these things are very clean to be seen in examples. And they lead to pictures which look like that. Basically, now I have a green and a brown contribution to the large order behavior. But if I want, I can also imagine these arrows going the reverse direction and extracting <coughs> data for these sectors. And I'm not even, we have formula for generic cases that I'm not even going to show you. But you can do all of these cases. Now, what's going to happen is that there's going to be, uh, in, in the asymptotics of multi-instantons, there's going to be novelties in, the, in these asymptotics. It's not only that we're going to have g factorial growth. There are some phenomena that I will not discuss associated to the resonance that give rise to g factorial log g growth. They're actually dominant with compared to that, so they're really easy to see in the computer. And we can try to see if these asymptotics hold in examples, and they've been found in many examples. Here I'm just putting on, this is not uh, chronological. This is just from easier to harder, at least in my, my humble opinion. And um, it's been addressed in lots of work. What I will be focusing on in the example of string theory, it's going to be topological strings in local P2. I will not say anything about all the other examples. And we're going to see how that works. Generic cases might be harder. This is the example of <laughs> would be very complicated situation where the asymptotics, <coughs> hopefully, I'll never have to work out. All right, so that kind of concludes the first half. So we have uh, given this, this formalism of, of the alien derivative, which is a little bit technical. Uh, we can access, we can uh, compute all required information on, on the discontinuities of my trans series. And I can write down uh, quite general formulae for the asymptotics that I can use to check if the train series for string theory or whatever other problem is working fine, and then try eventually to resum it and to obtain uh, some information at non-perturbative values of, of the string coupling. And that's what I'll try to show you now in the second half. The example I want to discuss topological string theory in local P2, but let me just make some comments generic before starting with the example of local P2. And we'll be dealing with the B model on some local clavial. Most cases that this story applies, they're mirrored to some toric, such that the information is encoded in the mirror curve. Basically, by computing periods in the mirror curve, I will compute most of the information I need. As I've said a couple of slides ago, this is what the free energy of the string theory will look like. Here's the string coupling. Here's some moduli associated to the geometry. In this case, they're complex structure moduli. 
how do I compute these guys? At the end of the day, I will need data, perturbative data to start off with, and then try to check what's its asymptotics, how can I resum it, and so on. Here's the idea, I'm not going to show how this comes about. The idea is that basically these quantities, they're not actually holomorphic in the complex structure moduli. There's a holomorphic anomaly, which is, you know, if you want a, an idea of where it comes about, if I try to compute the anti-holomorphic derivative, it's given by an integration over moduli spaces of genus G surface. And while the integrand is a total derivative, there is a boundary to this space, which makes that this is non-zero. There's a very simple picture of this. Uh, what do you mean by non-trivial information over CYG material even? Non-trivial information, where is that? Oh, no, no, I just mean that if you want to compute these objects, you will be well done by just looking at the mirror curve. Of what? Of the Riemann surfaces? No, 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 please don't, okay, there's, there, there may, there's two Riemann surfaces here. So, the first thing is that if I have a Calabiao which is mirrored to some toric threefold, there's a mirror surface, a mirror uh, I'm sorry, not mirror. There's a surface, which is the mirror curve. Forget about that. Then there's another thing, which is uh, I'm doing a genus calculation to compute the perturbative expansion of the string theory. And then there's a genus, there's a genus G surface associated with each order of perturbation theory. Don't confuse the two surfaces. So as I was saying, the reason why the derivative is not zero is because this moduli space has a boundary. And the boundary is, of course, when, uh, here's an example, when there's a degeneration, it basically corresponds to the moduli where the surface degenerates to lower genus. There's one way to have a degeneration to still a connected case. And here's an example where you have a degeneration to a disconnected case. And this leads to the holomorphic anomaly equations, basically. The connected degeneration gives you basically a, a second, an operator acting on a G minus one, and the disconnected one, there's several different ways in which you can get it. The exact way to write this formula is written here. So the anti-holomorphic dependence is included in an object, which is known as a propagator. If you want, it's a potential for the Yukawa couplings in the problem. And the derivative ha these derivatives here are with respect to z, to the complex structure modulus. And there can be either regular derivatives or covariant derivatives. And we will, this, this equation has been known for, this paper I think is from 92, BCOV, uh, and it's been solved perturbatively to very high orders uh, in this example. That's the example we're going to be focusing on, the canonical bundle over P2, <coughs> known as local P2 colloquially. And um, I'm actually not sure to how much orders these guys went, but probably the same that we did, which was about 112. So we, we, this, this is actually an effective way to generate perturbative data. So you can get lots of information and try to play with it. What happens if I look at the perturbative series? It's got dependence on holomorphic and anti-holomorphic uh, coordinates. What's its large order behavior? This is the first question you will have if you generate data up to genus 112. How is it growing? There's two possibilities here. There will be an instanton action controlling this growth, and the instanton action might, might be holomorphic. And so, I, I'm, I'm sorry, that is not what I meant, I meant the other way. The instanton action might be, have an anti-holomorphic contribution to explain the growth of these guys, or it might still be holomorphic and explain the growth of these guys. And by the way, by the upper arrow, I'm just talking about the cases where there's large end dualities with a matrix model where I just have to deal with holomorphic quantities. How can I know how this works? What so one way... What does these arrows mean? Uh, so this, this arrow here just means that there might be, uh, in some examples, you have dual, large, large end dualities to matrix models where the anti-holomorphic dependence goes away. That's what the upper arrow means. The, these arrows going up, they just mean what is controlling the large order behavior. Is it this, an instant on action which just has holomorphic dependence, or is it an instant on action that will have? All <coughs> this is a question mark. Does the does the dots? I'm not at this stage. I'm just telling you an example of a question that you would want to make. In two slides, I'll answer it. Here. And the question is, how am I going to be able to answer this question? 
and our suggestion is to rewrite the holomorphic anomaly equations for the partition function instead. You see, the holomorphic anomaly equations, they're basically recursive equations here, genus G, stuff at genus minus 1, genus minus H. Notice the endpoints of integration of, of the sum here. They don't allow for H to be 0 or G. Uh, how would I put a trans series ansatz here? It's not obvious. But if I could somehow rewrite them for the partition function, I could then solve naturally with the trans series ansatz. This is actually very simple to do. Why the covariant derivative in the previous uh, uh, covariant derivatives over f0 g minus 1 and ordinary derivative yeah. over? It doesn't matter. For, for all, if, if you don't know this story, you don't need to worry about that. All you need to worry about, or all you need for the, for the following, is to know that this is a recursive, uh, it's, it's a recursive formula that if I know the previous guys, I can generate the next guy. So it's a way to generate the perturbative expansion. The details are not important for the, for, for this, for the purpose of this talk at, at this stage. What I want to know is if I could find analog expressions to this one, but instead of giving me uh, recursive expressions to generate data in the perturbative case, if I could get recursive expressions to generate data for non-perturbative sectors in the trans series, basically for these guys here. It's a Cauchy problem that you have, yeah? Sorry? In the holomorphic anomaly, it's a recursive Cauchy problem. You have to set up the, the genus 0 and genus 1, yes. And then you can do everything from that. Data and the yes. second yes. order. <coughs> Second order? No, first order. The right -hand side? Yes, but you're so for S. Basically, you're going to compute. But, uh, but there's D, I, D, J, F, J, minus one. Yes, but what you're going to compute is the dependence of these guys in these S's. I will show you. There's two derivatives, I agree. Yeah, so, so you yes. expect to be Gervais 2? No, it will be Gervais 1. Oh, it depends what you call Gervais 1. Okay. <laughs> yes, yes, okay. I'm sorry? The one derivative is in Z bar and yes, yes, the uh, yes. derivative is in Z. It's like in the heat kernel. Okay. The no, 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 no. The only derivative in Z bar is this one here. One. These ones are derivatives in Z. That's what I just said. Okay. In one variable, there is only one derivative. <coughs> That's what I said. And another one. So it's a, it's a one <laughs> first order differential equation yeah. in in some things that it's not. Like it equation. So should we want right. yeah. to adopt this uh, kernel? Let's rewrite it for z. Here it is. Here's an example where the complex structure moduli space has dimension 1. So basically, there are single z and single s. That's the equation for z. It is heat equation-like, as you were saying, but it's, that's not enough. If you just put the heat equation thing, you don't get the exact holomorphic canal equations. So you need to have corrections, which basically I, I quote here as initial data, if you want, but it's quote unquote. Th these are corrections associated to genus 0 and genus 1 contributions. And basically what they are doing is making sure that the limits in the sum are correct. If you just put the heat equation, h will start at 0 and it will go all the way up to g, which is not what you need. In fact, if it goes all the way up to g, no longer have a recursive equation here. But that's just a minor detail. That's the thing that you get. And now you have an equation for z. So you can try to plug in z as well, let me say something before, sorry, it was right here. If I just put z as exponential of f0, I get back the holomorphic anomaly equations. Now what I want to do is to, to put z as exponential of the trans series and see what will this create for me. And here's what it does. It will lead again to recursion now for the non-perturbative components for these guys here. And the first term in the, in the recursion is this equation. That's the question I asked first. Will the instant on action be holomorphic or not? Here it's telling me that it will. And that's good, because that means that I can compute A as an appropriate combination of the periods in the geometry, periods on this, rim, on this, I'm sorry, on this mirror curve. And this is, in parallel, what had been conjectured in a slightly different example by these people, that it should always be the case. It's very nice to see that, in fact, it is. And the equations that we get, what we dub the non-perturbative holomorphic anomaly equations, they're written here for this case of 
uh, modelized space of dimension one. So I still have the derivative there with respect to the anti-holomorphic dependence. And now if you want, it's quote unquote covertized because the derivative of the instanton action appears. Then I have a term, I'm not telling you what this curly D is. There's in fact, there are several curly Ds. One of them is the second derivative that appeared earlier. And then there's sort of the quadratic piece. Now it's not only <coughs> the, the derivatives of these guys multiplied, but also has contributions from the uh, derivative of the instant on action. Did you define this, uh, what is non-perturbative transitive components? I may be lost. I I'm sorry, what was it? I didn't what is non-perturbative? Uh, it's all anything where n is different from zero. So it will be the one, two, three, n instant on contributions. And when n is zero, it's just perturbative. That's the nomenclature here. So that's the answer. I, I can do a s I think, how long do I have? Uh, okay, let me do a, just a very uh, short interlude that this, these things can be generalized for the refined uh, uh, holomorphic anomaly. Basically, it's an, I, I don't want to say a lot about this. It's just a case where instead of having just the G string that you have in the standard topological string, you end up with two parameters that they compute for you in a class of partition functions in omega background. There's also some holomorphic anomaly questions for this. And why it is anomaly you're considering? Why you're saying it is anomaly? Because naively you would have expected this, I said a, a while ago, sorry. Naively you could have expected that this derivative would be zero. And because it's not, you call it an anomaly. But if you want, it's just nomenclature. The same procedure can be run here. I'm just going to flash you two slides. I don't want to talk too much about this and go to the straight to the examples of local partition. <coughs> it's not too hard to see that you can also write the master equation for the refined holomorphic anomaly, which, when you choose epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 in the standard topological string limit, gets you back uh, the standard master equation. And if you take the so-called nekrasov shatashvili limit, it also gets you another master equation. And this allows you to compute non-perturbative versions of the, of the refined uh, recursion. Here in the case of in the NS limit, you see that the, the derivative with respect to A disappeared, but I get a different set of operators there. But that's just a comment. I don't really want to go into that. What I want to continue is to say that the same way that I could have solved the perturbative topological string and compute solutions, these are polynomials in this variable S of the degree 3G three, three minus 3, the non-perturbative topological string, I can crank the wheel in this, in this recursion and generate data as well. Now, because of that term that appears next to the derivative in S, in the derivative of, of, of A, there's going to be exponential terms there. This doesn't this this happen in the refined NS limit. But again, that's just a comment. What we would like to do now is to know whether the solutions that I get, this one instanton, two instanton terms, and so on, are correct. If this guess that this non-perturbative version of the holomorphic anomaly is the correct way to generate data, is the correct guess or not. And so we're going to show this in the example of local P2. And basically, I'm just going to show you plot stuff. Excuse me, may I ask a question? Sure. I thought that the statement that the, you guys were making, I learned from Marcos, was that the limit when one epsilon goes to zero gives answer uh, same as epsilon one plus epsilon two goes to zero plus non perturbative. So basically, in the case when one epsilon is zero, that contains both perturbative and non perturbative answers for topological strings. Am I right? Th that's not the claim I'm doing. Uh, I'm not sure which one. So th the only claim that I'll be doing in the following concerns taking their sum to zero. This one, this is all the that's all I'll say about. There's the other one, which, yeah, I can show I thought that the There's this one here. Way, yeah, some clever way it was reconstructed that non-perturbative corrections already are known. Th this is a different story from, it's a different story. I don't know if you want to comment about that, Marcus, but it's a different story from the one I'm going to talk about today. Do you want to say something? 
Well, I mean, what we do is to do a, a non-protective definition. Ricardo is talking about constructing transiries. Then yes. there is uh, another issue of how these two things compare, and this will also start. I, I will talk about the comparison. Come yes. out from yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. So this is more general, yes. Obviously, Obviously the general formal okay. construction of transiries. Okay. And then, you know, maybe he will comment on that. I will com comment about the comparison, but I will not say okay. anything about his work. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> So let's see how that works in the case of local P2. So here's a check of instanton actions. They're going to be instanton actions. They're associated to periods in the geometry. And what are those periods going to be? So there's, it turns out, I'm not going to give you all the details, it turns out that the good coordinate to use <coughs> is not Zev. It's going to be this coordinate Psi, which is, if you want is the cubic root of Z. And there's going to be three conifold points at basically at cubic roots of unity in this variable psi. And you, you know, via Picard Fuchs and so on, you can compute instanton actions, you can compute out of these periods. And basically, here's the solution for you for the instanton actions around the conifold point. They're given by nasty formula, but whatever, it's what it is. And there's three of them. And here's a test. Let me try to tell you what kind of what I mean by a test. Remember this formula I showed you here. So I want to test, say, the instant on action here. I know this sequence up to genus, I don't know, 112, whatever we computed it. And I'm going to, you know, work out, out of this sequence, if I can extract A and how much, the, the A that I extract out of this sequence, how much does it agree or disagree with my prediction coming from computing a period. And here's what it is. So basically, in green, it's what comes out of testing the sequence for the instant on action associated to the first conifold point, basically that one. Here, TC is the flat coordinate around the conifold, basically for this function. And in blue is what that function is, and you know, it's spot on. And then th there, there's, a, there's a region of psi where the 4 pi, squa 4 pi squared i instant on action kicks in, and it takes, takes dominance. The results seem pretty convincing. There's, in fact, three instanton actions associated to these three conifold points. And here I'm just plotting for you branch points and cuts of each of one of them. Conifold 1, conifold 2, conifold 3. But that's not the whole story. There's also, if you want, around the large radius point, uh, there's also a, an action, which we can call you know, the Kähler action or the large radius action, whatever you want to call it, which is given by basically by the mirror map given by a Myers G function. That will also contribute. Let me show you how they contribute. In this plot, I am showing how the conifold and the killer actions uh, play against, against each other. In red, so what am I plotting here? So what I'm plotting here is um, out of the perturbative series, I construct a, Borel pa uh, I construct a Padé approximant to the Borel transform. So the Padé approximant, remember, is a rational function, and if I know their singularities, I will sort of know where the, the cuts of these simple singularities will be located. And in black, the dot, dots that you see all over, these dots are uh, precisely the singularities of the Padé approximant to the Borel transform. Then in red, in fact, the colors are the analytic results. In, in red, I'm telling you, as I vary psi, notice that psi, the, the complex structure modulus is changing. I'm bringing it from 2.5 all the way down to 0, 0.625. I'm, I'm, I'm plotting the trajectory in red that the one instanton uh, action is doing, in green the two instanton, and in purple the Kähler. And you can see that, you know, let's, let's follow the, 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 the conifold one. The, the, the dots, the singularities of the poly approximant are just always there, spot on. Right? And you can follow with your eyes the same thing for, for, the, for the conifold 2. The Kähler, it's right there. And you see that it's contributing. And then when it basically, there's a region where it's gone. So basically what happens here is that we have an illustration of what is known as high order Stokes phenomenon. That sometimes also the Stokes constants themselves can jump and can take stuff out of contributing to the large order. This actually... <laughs> It's very neat that this, these things happen also in this example. 
So we have some you know, strong checks of all these instant on actions. Now we want to know, remember that the, 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 the final thing that I did in the previous section was to compute one instant on and two instant on contributions. Let's check if this is also good or not. Sorry. Here's a check of uh, so around the conifold one, the one instant on sector there. The one instant on sector should look like something like that. And this is testable at large order by using this sequence, where I already know there's perturbative data, I know. Of course, G never goes to infinity. I'm limited by whatever the computer can give you. And this is previous guys that I've already checked, and I'm going to check the next guy. And I'm going to do this at genus 0, 1, 2, 3. This is the next three figures that's going to appear. Genus 0, 1, 2, 3. And I'm going to do this at three different points in moduli space. There's a point there which is psi close 2, and there's two others. I don't remember their values. They're just complex numbers. And so these three points are these three columns that I'm going to show you here. And you can already see that there's some dots that are just spot on on top of the lines. The dots, basically I have blue dots and green dots. They just give you the real and imaginary contributions to that guy. The dots are coming out of the sequence. And I'm testing that function with a line. Yeah. I think it's pretty convincing. The data is telling you that this was the correct way to compute the one instanton terms. We can do the same for the two instantons. Now the function is more complicated. And by the way, there's also two contributions. I don't want to get too much into that. But at two instanton level, there's basically the contributing with the same weight to large order. There's the second instanton of conifold one. And there's a mixed contribution of conifold 1 and conifold 2. Uh, no, I'm sorry, I didn't mean conifold 2. I mean conifold 1, it appears with two different powers of the instant on action. There's the plus and the minus. This is the, the, the picture that I've showed you before, where there was the green arrows and the brown arrows. They both contribute. So there's another function appearing there. These two terms are testable out of this sequence, which, if you want, is the large order of the one instant on that we have already checked. And these terms appear here and here. And in the next figure, at the fixed point of moduli space and varying propagator, I'm showing you some tests. This is the test of the two instanton conifold, and this is the plus minus conifold. I think, again, the tests are very convincing. <coughs> uh, that also the two instanton contribution is coming out straight out of this. So we know that this, this method to generate for you the non-perturbative completion of topological strings using this non-perturbative version of the holomorphic anomaly equations seems to be generating a train series which completely agrees with what is expected from asymptotics. So now the second question is, can we use it to resum and to actually compare against something? Let me just, I think maybe this has been a little bit dense. Go back to one of the first slides where I was telling you how to do resummation. So basically, there are several steps. I have I start out of the perturbative guy, then I try to do this borel pade approximation, but I have to do borel pade of all the instantons, or as many as I can numerically, and put them back in the trans series. That's what we're going to do. Uh, let me find just some index to go back. Yeah. What am I comparing here? So first of all, there's this uh, massive amount of work by Marcus and collaborators on giving non-perturbative definitions for local P2 and other examples, string theory in these in this backgrounds. These, these definitions come out of quantizing the mirror curve. So basically, they start with a mirror curve. They construct some, if you want, Schrodinger-like operators, and things work by. I'm not going to have a lot to say about that. What, what I want to talk about is the comparison from the results that they have obtained with the suggestion that you know, the trans series also capturing with a specific semi-classical decoding that Mark has already talked about in the morning, the same, the same phenomenon. And, and here we see, you know, in, in, in black, the black line, 
is what comes out of doing the resummation of the perturbative alone of the F0s using Borel Padi of the perturbative. And in red is the exact results. And you say, great, we're done. There's nothing else to be said. That's not true. I mean, it looks really nice on the plot. But uh, if you look at the numbers, there is a consistent mismatch to all of them. So that's not the perturbative is not the whole story. So what can we do to check if that mismatch is actually captured by the trans series or not? We can check the difference <coughs> between this mismatch and what the trans series tells you that the one instant on contribution should be. This one instant on contribution, if you want, is what I'm expecting to be, you know, it's the next guy in the trans series that I'm expecting to give the correction. Here's a comparison. By the way, this is taken from different papers. So now I have here lambda and, uh, I'm sorry, n and h bar, but h bar is basically g string. And, and if you want, n is lambda, which is the flat coordinates. I am sorry, this is a different paper, so we, we use different notation, but the idea should be clear. And what we're doing here is we're comparing this difference. And if the difference is good, it has a dot. The different colors in the dots just means how much numerical digits am I matching against. And if the comparison is bad, we have a cross. And you say, OK, this is not so good. It's good somewhere. It's not good some other way else. But you can ask, what's, the, what's the, the boundary that separates good from bad? And that curve is precisely the Stokes line for the second instant on sector that I talked about previously. <coughs> and so you'd say, OK, I only expect things to match if I take Stokes phenomenon into account. What happens upon Stokes phenomenon? <laughs> it's not a big surprise that things match once I do Stokes jump of the trans series coefficient, things match on the other side. So in fact, not only this method to construct the trans series is validated by asymptotics, but very nicely matches against uh, a large body of work that Marcus and collaborators have had achieved. So this is very nice. You can ask if you can go further. Uh, here's an idea of something which would be nice. We haven't done this, but it would be nice to look at which is the case of string theory and local P1 cross P1. Because now, there are two distinct non-perturbative definitions in the literature. One is the one that we've used also for local P2 of Marcus and collaborators, quantization of the mirror curve. The partition functions, here's the partition functions, they came out of this expansion here of the Fredholm determinants, where this rho is just the inverse of the quantized mirror curve. But there's another definition for, for, you know, based on large end duality, that also the partition function of string theory in that background should be given by Chern Simons on a lens space, which localizes to a two-cut matrix model. So there are several interesting questions here. One is to ask how much do these definitions differ? That's, that's an interesting question in itself, but in some sense doesn't have a lot to do with resurgence. The other question is, what happens if I construct a trans series? By, by this method of the non-perturbative holomorphic anomaly equations, I would expect to construct a single trans series. So can the same trans series match both results? The, the naive expectation, again, we haven't done this. I cannot give you a definite answer. But the naive expectation would be that you could think of the trans series as sort of a, a general solution to the differential equation. And the non-perturbative definitions as different choices of boundary conditions. So by choosing different trans series parameters, I am matching against one or another of these definitions. This is only possible, of course, if the high, how much do these definitions differ is by exponential different terms, where the exponential is controlled by the instant on action. And then the choice of different trans series parameters would amount to different semi-classical decodings via the trans series of these two definitions. In the spirit, oops, there goes the iPad again. In the spirit of what Marcus was saying. All right, let me just give you a one minute thing that <laughs> What happens in the A model? The A model gives you Gromov with an invariance. Gromov with an invariance should see some trace of this G factorial growth. And it so happens that you only see this trace if the genus and degree grow at the same time. I'm not going to say anything else because I think I'm overdone with time. So I hope I've convinced you that these things are, 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 are useful in physics. And more generically here, that was what I was asked to in, in string theory. And the observables, 
seems very clear that they can be described by resurgent functions. So we can construct them non-perturbatively starting out of perturbative theory date. And, but of course there's many things that still can be done. I mean, besides, I'll just give you comment on one thing, besides the applying this to many other examples, I didn't say anything about Stokes constants. I didn't say how to compute them. And in fact, this is, this is a pressing question because in most examples we can only access it numerically. I mentioned this in passing. It would be very nice to have some first principle approach to computing them, but I would say that that's one of the, the big open problems at this stage. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? String theory applications. Uh, are there some cases where you can analytically compute the large order behavior of, a, of the series that you generate at F0? Yes, yes. There's, uh, there's this, this string theory on the conifold. This is a very simple example. You can compute efficient function exactly, and then you can also know all the terms in the, in the large order expansion, and compute all these things analytically. That, that's a nice example. I have a question about your assumption that at the beginning that the, the, the resurgent function was simple, so only had low yeah. <coughs> singularities and yes. simple poles. Yes. Does anything you said afterwards, uh, can, it, can anything you said afterwards be generalized to the case when you have a fractional power or singularities? Like right, so, so it, well, there, there's one thing that I should say is that this, this class is not as restricted as it, as it seems. Because what, what happens is that uh, you can consider, if I, if I just write down for you the perturbative series with, say, with some coupling, GS, I can say, well, why don't, instead of looking at this series, I look at GS to the power of five halves times it. And then it turns out that if you do that, you basically you get a, uh, a Borel transform, which is not going to have logs, it's going to have square root branch cuts or whatever, but it's going to be related by fractional derivatives to the one with logs. So somehow, instead of thinking of, you know, there's only one way to, to reach the simple case, there's many ways. So basically, it's a representative of a lot of different possible Borel transforms. So it's a, a rather large class. I'm sorry, I'm not listening. What could you say about applicability of these ideas to renormalons? Uh, well, for renormalons, I, I really wouldn't know what to do because you need a semi-classical description. That's something which is required in all, in all these. There's no semi-classical description. Right? right. So that's why I'm saying I, don't, I wouldn't know what to do. <laughs> imagine, imagine they give you a theory. Imagine they give you a theory yes. in which the expansion has factorial behavior. Yes. How would the code? How do they know this? Oh, then you can extract some information of what this would be semi-classical <laughs> description would be out of, of, a, of a sequence by using this sort of tests that I illustrated for the topological string case. So basically you just you can extract the instant on action. What would be the, let's say, renormal on action? You could extract what would be the one loop around the one renormal on sector. You could extract these numbers, but I, I, at least I wouldn't know what to compare them against because I still lack some semi-classical theory telling me what renormal ones are. But certainly out of, of the sequence, I could extract some data. But there's another problem, which is it's very hard to generate <laughs> data with Feynman diagrams. In these cases, it's much easier to generate because we have recursion relations that allow us to generate a lot of data. But there's another, uh, another thing which could happen. Uh, you may have some what I call the duplicative corrections, which are not visible to uh, uh, You could have. Just to just give you an example, yeah. so imagine you have some theory which has, see, which on classical classical level have some symmetry, like chiral symmetry, yeah. and you know the perturbative chiral symmetry is broken. Yeah. So there is no way perturbative will generate those characters. So, in some sense. Right. Uh, well, look, I, I haven't done this example, so I, I don't know how much you could extract out of looking at these sequences. I know some things you could extract. I'm not claiming you could extract everything. But would, would Fred just summarize what you were saying? Yeah. Basically, this technique says it works fine as soon as you know that the bit of corrections comes only from the instantons. Well, not necessarily. Some of these objects, we wouldn't have also an instanton description from them. At least I would enlarge this claim to instanton-like objects. We, there, there, there are some objects that we find here that we know that they're there, I didn't talk about them, that we don't have a semi-classical description for. 
They're not renormalons because these are theories without renormalization, but we don't know what they are. So I, I wouldn't say that instantons is just the only thing you can see here. You can see more than that. But, if, but even in the case of the instantons, yes. there's, a, there's a question which I, somehow I, I didn't understand the, from the presentation. There's always ambiguity how we choose integration control. There's but always mm. ambiguity in choosing integration control with Borel integrals. So here it's translated to this choice of, of the turn series parameter, if you want. And one way that you can do this is that uh, you have some, say, in the case of topological strings, we have the non-perturbative definition that Marcus gave us. We test it at a specific point to fix the trace series parameter, and then we just enlarge and go throughout moduli space and see. So we, if you want, we do a measurement, and we use that measurement to, to then check that everything is consistent everywhere else. Okay. No more questions? Let's thank all speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you.